We are now recording. Okay, folks, welcome again. Welcome to David Koresh's house. We got a warm fire going on. It's just like Jim Jones, let's have a glass of Kool-Aid. It's just me. We're going to talk about something fantastic tonight. <laughs> so, I, you know, Melissa, we were talking earlier. I happened, I was surfing through the channels today, and there was a, there's a guy out of New Zealand. His name is Pastor Don Wilton. And he has this show called The Encouraging Word. And I've mentioned it before, but it just infuriates me every time I see this guy on there with my name spread. And he was preaching this fire and brimstone stuff. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to figure out how to put a stop to that. Because yeah. every time every time I see hear them talking about that fire and brimstone and Jesus is going to return, all I can think of is I bet them Hindus aren't going to play that game. I can see a bunch of Hindu monks sitting up there in the Himalayas going, ooh, look at that one down there. He's a big, he's a big one, honey. Look at him tear shit up. Woo, watch him go. You know, they're not going to play that game. <laughs> I just crack, I start laughing every time I hear it. I can't, I can't tolerate it. <laughs> Only a fool laughs at his own jokes. But this is what I should have done a few weeks ago and I didn't do it. We're going to continue talking about Tacitus. And uh, he's an interesting cat. You know, I've said it many times, a lot of people will write something and they'll make a lot of money. And then five years, nobody can tell me what the number one bestseller was on the New York Times list five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But this cat wrote something that, uh, well, it stood the test of time. I guess that means something. I don't know if it, if it's a face value kind of examination or if it's uh it's what it is, but here it is a thousand years later, and we still got this this writing that's uh that's important in a in an age of in a in this age of anxiety where everything is so disposable given an instant you know even Harry Potter's starting to fade you know it was such a phenomenon you know she's but give it another fifteen years where's that going to be at we're going to remember that, but with these classics like Tacitus we're still we're still running strong on that. A lot of people have said a lot of things, but <laughs> we'll start here on, on chapter 14 and just pick up where we left off. It says, in the field of battle, is, it is disgraceful for the chief to be surpassed in valor. It is disgraceful for the companions not to equal their chief. And that's, a, that's a hell of a conundrum. But it's also... Uh, that's a healthy demonstration of masculinity. If I could, if you could ever find one in anything that's been written, that's got to be at the top of the list. The chief should not be surpassed in valor, and it's disgraceful for the companions not to equal their chief. That is good, healthy, strong, masculine, male bonding, if I ever heard of such a thing. But it is reproach and infamy during a whole succeeding life, not just this life, but the next one too, you're screwed to retreat from the field surviving him. So there's, there's something to be said for that. There's a, there's an element of commitment for men that goes into that, that you really can't find anywhere else. It's really hard to recreate in the business world where everybody's working for the dollar, but to find men that are out there doing that for each other, and for their survival of everything they love, their families, their children, their future, to get out there and give it at all. If one guy walks back from that, he should be shamed in this life and the succeeding life to retreat from the field, surviving his chief. What a, uh, what a powerfully motivating idea. When you, if, you, if you come across a group of people that live like that, it's no wonder they kick the shit out of the Romans. You know, maybe not all the time. They eventually did lose, <laughs> but it wasn't for lack of trying. That means something. I think that means something to us today. It's not for lack of trying. We've got to keep doing something. It's kind of like when Freya calls Heindler her sister. I see people call each other brother quite a bit. And they don't know each other, but they do. So it's kind of a weird thing. Some people hate it, some people expect it, some people really couldn't care less, but 
it all kind of stems from those three lines. Wanting to be a part of something better. Wanting to be part of something great. You know, if somebody calls you brother, he probably thinks pretty highly of you. Wants to be like you. Wants to be a part of your weird or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> In an age where we're all so comfortable and we don't have a place to go and do that, what do we do to find or supplant that field of uh, endeavor in our lives today? Competition, competition is the healthiest thing I can think of. When Will starts lifting out in California, he's posting his videos, I'm trying to beat him or match him. I love it, it's fantastic. The Army was a heyday of competition for me. I loved every bit of it, but I digress. Those are the kind of things we need to be looking for when we talk about building men, cultivating that sense of not one-upsmanship, but healthy competition, respect. You find it in the gyms, the martial arts gyms for sure. Find it in the military. And in some respects, you will find it in the, uh, in the penitentiary system. And, and in every case, the stakes are, couldn't be higher to tell you the truth. To aid, to protect him, to place their own gallant actions to the account of his, his glory is their first and foremost sacred engagement. So it's not just a duty, it's a sacred engagement. It's an honor. You know, there's, there's something special when, the, when the, the chief says, man, it's been an honor to serve with you. That means they lived up to their obligations. That means they, they met the standard. Something very fulfilling in a man's heart to figure that out, to find themselves in a situation where they want to be a part of something like that. It's not something you come across every day. You sure don't come across it working on a factory assembly line. The chiefs fight for victory, the companions for their chief. That's pretty good. I mean, you can't go wrong with something like that. If their native country be long sunk in war, in peace and in action, many of the young nobles repair to some other state then engaged in war. It's an active endeavor to go find a place where a young man might prove himself a man. And like I say, the military is about the only thing we have like that right now. You're certainly not going to find that in college. For besides, that repose is unwelcome to their race, and toils and perils afford them a better opportunity of distinguishing themselves. They are unable, without war and violence, to maintain a large train of followers. <laughs> And I'm going to say something about that that some people aren't going to like, but most of the things that we react to within our group of people are things we're trying to cultivate for that very mindset. It's still very much within us. And so we create a perception of struggle. And, 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 it, and it's, it goes from legitimate to the extreme of ridiculousness. We're trying to find a place to prove ourselves. And we finally have found a spirituality that encourages us to do so, not to wait for somebody else to give it to us, but an opportunity to really get out there and get it on. That means something. <laughs> I think that might be one of our next great challenges for us to become what we're supposed to become. It's fine to that area where we might not create some stress or drama or petty bickering or create some enemy uh, I think the ideas of the boomer, I mean, yeah, there's all kinds of legitimate things that go with that, but I think a large part of it is us trying to create a perception of struggle because we're made to strive in these toils. We're made to go out there and try. There's an industry of masculinity trying to convince men to get off their big old butts and get out there and try to do something. You know, it's not so cool to grow a man belly anymore. I should know, I tried. <laughs> but be that as it may, that's something we've got to start thinking about. Let's see, where'd I go? The companion requires from the liberality of his chief, the warlike steed, the bloody and conquering spear, and in place of pay, he expects to be supplied with the table, homely indeed, but plentiful. So he gets a cut. He goes out there, that's how he earns a cut. He gets a piece of the pie. In the world of business, it's a terrifying thought for, to give your employee a piece of the pie. 
and it has remnants of communism and socialism and unions and all that stuff. But I will tell you, my grandfather worked with a man who was a start of the machine shop in the late forties after the war. He gave every employee a piece of that company and every employee in that company retired from it a millionaire. They all had a vested interest in the success of that operation. But if you were to approach GE or Boeing or somebody like that and say, look, give everybody a piece of the pie, make them a part owner. Let's see what they do. Very few CEOs are going to give up a $30 million paycheck. Yeah, I, fuck, I can't blame them. I mean, system got set up that way. It's going to be hell to change it. <laughs> but for those few of us who are brave enough, who have right here a, a historical writing that suggests that that might be a pretty good way to go. It might be a pretty good way to go. Anyway. And I think somehow the, the part of that was how some people determined that socialism was the natural state of government for, for Germanic peoples. I don't necessarily see that. I see, you know, that's, I'm a fiercely independent individual. I just really don't want anybody telling me what to do. That's just the way it is. I think that's an American thing. The funds for this munificence must be found in war and rapine, nor are they so easily persuaded to cultivate the earth and to wait the produce of the seasons as to challenge the foe and expose themselves to wounds. Nay, they even think it base and spiritless to earn by sweat what they might purchase with blood. <laughs> I have mixed feelings about that. I think that's, you know, this was written by a Roman about a, a, an opposing force, so to speak, one that gave them no end of hell. Um, and yet when you look at the month of September alone, during the changeover, the, the, the rapid advance of Catholicism across the continent of Europe, September in the harvest was such an important part that every single day, I think it's in, uh, it's not in the history of pagan Europe. It may be, uh, I'll have to find it, but every day it may be God against the gods. Every day of the month of September was made a Catholic holy day to a saint because that was the harvest time. That was a time of celebration. These people were celebrating the bounty. They had hunting. They had harvests. There was a great time of feasting and people coming together and all kinds of celebrations. <laughs> so they, they did their best to eradicate those pagan ideas by making every single day of that month <laughs> a Christian holiday. Um, so I, I have mixed feelings about that idea. I don't think so much. I think when you combine the two, you end up with a very powerful people. You end up with a very powerful people who understand their interaction with the world around them and their ability to protect it in the most powerful of manners. That's a pretty, that's a pretty high-minded idea. And I think it's one that we all kind of yearn for in a lot of ways. Give me something to defend. It says on every drill sergeant badge, it says, this will defend. And I always thought that was pretty inspiring. You bet, I'll defend this. I'll get, I'll, I'll run towards the gunfire. This I will defend. And now that we don't have sometimes that structure and we find ourselves in the spirituality, we look for something that we'd be willing to do something for. <laughs> I think we can do better in finding out what that needs to be. And I think most, I think the best way to do that is to start with our home, with our child, our children, our spouses, that's where we start and build out from there. Because, I mean, I've had three kids, but I've married women that had kids of their own. So now all of a sudden I have seven grandkids, you know, and all of those grandkids are going to see what grandpa thinks and feels and talks about. So I've started in my home and it's continued to, to grow as they interact with other people. You see, Justin Garcia is doing the same thing with his sons and daughter. He's doing a fine job with it. Matt's fixing to do it with his new little girl, which I couldn't tell you how tickled I am that Matt and Mandy are having a kiddo. And that's where it starts in our homes. That's, that's literally all we have any control over. <clears throat> but sometimes it's not a lot of action. At any rate, during the intervals of war, they pass the time less in hunting than in sluggish repose, divided between sleep and the table. All the bravest of the warriors committing the care of the house, the family affair, and the lands to the women. Old men and the weaker part of the domestics stupefy themselves in inaction. 
So wonderful is the contrast presented by nature that the same persons love indolence and hate tranquility. So you called them lazy. <laughs> but you know what? If you went out there and whipped the ass of everyone around you, um, yeah, I might take a little break too. But this is being written once again by Roman, whose lives were becoming very filled with lots of busyness. You know, and my brother's told me, man, he said, you can be busy and not make any money. <laughs> yeah, just show up. That's exactly right. Um, and I think a lot of people today, they, they spend their times. If you're not busy doing something, well, you're, you're wasting time. Well, <laughs> it is customary for the several states to present by volunteer and individual contributions, cattle or grain to their chiefs which are accepted as honorary gifts. So people, if somebody goes out there and does his level best on your behalf, yeah, give him a little something to make it, to show, show for it, you know? There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> they are peculiarly pleased with presents from neighboring nations, offered not only by individuals, but by the community at large, such as fine horses, heavy armor, rich housings, and gold chains. We have now taught them also to accept of money. So there was a time when the Theodists were real big on that, real big on the giving of gifts. And it, it got, I mean, people would give these fantastic rifles to their buddies and their friends. And, it was fan, and there was this exchange, a gift for a gift. And it was a very important part of our community for a long, long time. And I see sometimes that we've a little bit drifted away from that, but it really is a good thing to give to these people that you respect and call friends and, and share its generosity, its hospitality. It's a, it's a part of who and what we are. There's nothing that makes a person feel so special as the ability to give a gift um, with the exception of the ability to receive that gift because you've lived your life the right way. You've been doing the right things. You've been honest. You've walked a straight line. You've worked hard at what you're doing. Those are all important parts of what it means to walk through a community with your head held high and somebody look at you and say, you know what? I want some of what that guy's working in my life. That's where the rubber meets the road. And it's, uh, it's important. <laughs> Maybe we'll get back to it. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice. It's a, it was a nice gesture. And it was, and it's, once again, it's a part of our heritage. It is well known that none of the German nations inhabit cities or even admit of contiguous settlements. They dwell scattered and separate as a spring or a meadow or a grove may chance to invite them. And that's kind of how we are too. I mean, we've often talked about population density, but all of us are so fiercely independent. It's going to be very difficult without a field of battle to prove ourselves for us not to sit around and begin fighting amongst each other. You could put a group of us in a utopian society in the perfect uh, state of being uh, at whatever favorable government might think that somebody's going to sit down and say, you know what, I need to show what I'm made of. <laughs> I mean, it's just what men do. It's going to happen. And there's going to be some woman that thinks that woman probably should be smiling at my man like that. I'm going to show her what I'm made of. You know, we have to have those vents to, to release all of this passion of who we are. I think people are afraid to be passionate about their ideas. Um, because let's face it, social media is just a, a, a damn toilet. You know, everybody goes in there and flushes their idea of whatever they think. They stir the pot, they lead with the chin, they say the most radical, outrageous nonsense. There's no repercussions. <laughs> and we don't have any, we, we don't know, we can't do anything with that. We're attacked by this vague, nebulous, somebody said this about us, and immediately we're. Well, now I got nothing to do with it. I can't, I don't know how to vent that. So I don't know, it's, it's, I don't want to say, well, we got to practice acceptance. Well, screw a bunch of that nonsense. You know, some of these things need to be settled. But I digress anyway. But my point is these people were, they found those pretty places that called them. They became a part of that environment they lived in where there was a meadow or a spring or a grove they lived or they were a part of it. They made themselves a part of the environment in which they lived. There was a part of wherever they settled that they considered to be a special place, a special little holy place for them and their families to sit down, to eat together, to feast together. Um, we live in such a compact, neat, right, dress, right, dress kind of world. <laughs> it is stifling to our spirit, I think. And I don't think we're the only ones. 
Matter of fact, I'm sure we're not the only ones. Everyone yearns to find those wild places untouched by man and to feel like we're a part of it. Their villages are laid out, not like ours in rows of adjoining buildings, but everyone surrounds his house with a vacant space. We need that room. We just happen to be that people that need that room. Perhaps that's why we've been explorers and, and drifted all the way across this earth. Look at the Anglo-Saxons that created England. It was a melting pot of all of those northern tribes and it created an empire upon which the sun never set. We need that space to roam. Magazines at the newsstands and the pretty pictures on them just won't do it. <laughs> Social media has tapped into that need um, to see those places, to go and see and do and explore and filled it with images. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of those, they, YouTube, they filled it with all of these images and we get wrapped up in it because we are built to be wanderers. Everyone surrounds his house with a vacant space, either by way of security against fire or through ignorance of the art of building. Hey, Roman had to make that little jab. I got you. Okay. See, they got shitty comments all the way back then. They didn't even have social media. <laughs> or indeed, they are unacquainted with the use of mortar and tiles. He says that, and he goes on and says something else. And for every purpose, employ rude, unshapen timber, fashioned with no regard to pleasing the eye. But it worked. You know, it kept the rain off your head. They bestow more than ordinary pains in coating certain parts of their buildings with a kind of earth so pure and shining that it gives the appearance of a painting. But he just said they're unacquainted with the use of mortar. Well, they know something, don't they? Because all of those megalithic stones across Northern Europe, they knew how to move something at some time, something big. So sometimes you got to take what he says with a grain of salt. They also dig subterraneous caves and cover them with a great quantity of dung. As dung decomposes, it generates heat. You know, it's like most animals, they'll cover their nest with a lot of grass or it creates, stabilizes the temperature as well as creates an insulation. These they use as winter retreats and granaries. So in the winter, you go in there, you warm up granaries, preserve it, for they preserve a moderate temperature. And upon invasion, when the open country is plundered, these recesses remain unviolated, either because the enemy is ignorant of him or because he will not trouble himself with the search. Well, shit, no, he's not going to trouble himself with the search. There's a 10-foot pile of shit over there. I'm not digging through it. I mean, would you? I don't care what's in it. The clothing common to all is a sagum. And I think that's awesome. I think we should wear a sagum. I, when I hear that word, I just think of those baggy jeans. We got ourselves a sagum, fellas. Come on. Anyway, it's fastened by a clasp or in want of that, a thorn. With no other covering, they pass whole days on the hearth before the fire. You know, when it's 20 degrees below zero, yeah, you're going to sit in front of the fire. I don't care who you are. If I have a chance and I ain't got to do nothing, I'm going to sit right there by that fire and warm my bones. The more wealthy are distinguished by a vest. And I love this part. Not flowing loose like those of the Sarmatians and Parthians, but girt close and exhibiting the shape of every limb. So they're, they're like meathead junkies. They're like, they go to the gym with their sleeves cut out. They got their guns. It's like the gun show 24 seven with these things they wear. I love it. They also wear the skins of beasts. So they're a little savage too. It's kind of scary. Which the people near the borders are less curious and selecting or preparing than their more remote inhabitants. So those people inside the more remote inhabitants, they're gonna be wearing something nice. They're gonna be wearing otter skin which is the densest fur of just about any animal, bear skin, wolf skin. They'll be wearing something nice and warm. They're not going to be troubled with what that neighboring village across the river thinks about them wearing that fur. They're warm. They make choice of particular skins, which they variegate with spots and strips of the furs of marine animals. There's your sea otter. The produce of the exterior ocean and seas to us unknown. So at that, you know, it's still a lot of the world is unexplored or unknown or unremembered at that time, I guess is the better way to put it. The dress of the women does not differ from that of the men, except that they more frequently wear linen, which they stain with purple, and do not lengthen their upper garment into sleeves, but leave exposed the whole arm and part of the breast. Um, I could really go off on that, but I'm not going to. The matrimonial bond is nevertheless strict and severe among, among them nor is there anything in their manners more commendable than this. 
that's that's a beautiful thing. The matrimonial bond is nevertheless shut up. Quit in I'm gonna whip you if you don't quit talking. He's 20 years old and wants to live off. Anyway, <laughs> it's strict and severe among them, nor is there anything in their manners more commendable than this. When you have an enemy state who is at times conquering you and at times being conquered by you, and the one thing they call is the most commendable is the matrimonial bond between men and women. That says something about the entirety of the culture. That tells me that there's a source of strength there that we would be hard pressed to find today's world that's so convenient and disposable. We also have to remember that on that proving field, there is the danger of loss. And the value of individuals who take care of each other cannot be understated. Matrimonial, I think that's one of the I think that's one of the most wonderful things about who and what we have the capability to be, to, to make that matrimonial bond as, as special as it should be. When you look at Sigrid and Brunhild or Sigrid Rifa, whatever you want to call her, and he has proven himself and has what it takes to walk through that ring of fire to free that woman from the burning and he has demonstrated, he has proven himself a man. He has walked through the fire to free this woman and create an environment where she is safe to expose the beauty of who she is to the world. That's a powerful, powerful statement. That's a really high mark because I, I know every woman that I've ever talked to, it's a terrifying thing to express the beauty of who she is, not here in her face, but here in her heart. And for a man to walk through the fire and create that environment where she can express who she is and build that home where she might be free to express that, hey, man, now we're talking some big stuff. Now we're talking the real deal. Now we're talking about men being men and women being allowed to be women. What a wonderful idea that might be for us to strive towards. When she is free to express the beauty of who she is, the wisdom that she shares with Sigurd is unparalleled. The depth of what she shares with him is, is beyond what we can measure today. <laughs> and there's work that went into each side of that. She made a sacrifice. He made a sacrifice. And together, they found something neat. Now, when they walked off of that hill, they got screwed over by the world because we live in a world, whether we like it or not, that could care less whether or not we get to express the gifts that we have been given to become what we're supposed to become. Not a single person, your neighbor don't care. You know, that's just the way it is. We can either sit down and be mad about it, or we can sit down and focus on who we have as a partner and build something magnificent. There's a real challenge in that. <laughs> Almost singly among the barbarians, they content themselves with one wife. A very few of them accepted, who, not through incontinence, but because their alliance is solicited on account of their rank, practice polygamy. So sometimes there are marriages outside of the one man, one woman thing that, for political reasons, for political gain, the building of empires, the safety of the community. Um, the wife does not bring a dowry to her husband but receives one from him. Now, that's an important thing too, because if that marriage doesn't work out, that woman has something to fall back on. She's not left out there just swinging on her own. She's got a dowry she can fall back on to take care of herself if that marriage ends, because they can end that marriage. They had that right. <laughs> The parents and relations assemble and pass their approbation on the presents. Presents not adapted to please a female taste or decorate the bride, but oxen, a, a comparison to steed, a shield, a spear, and a sword. By virtue of these, the wife is espoused, and she in turn makes a present of some arms to her husband. This they consider as the firmest bond of union. They will fight for what they are going to build together. These, the sacred mysteries, which is what Brunhild shared with Sigurd and the conjugal deities, these gods of, of uh, fertility. 
because you got sometime in the past there was a point where people didn't realize that you know that little conjugal visit resulted in a baby they figured that was what the stork brought that was a blessing that was a blessing from the deities of fertility they held a very special place you know science began to tell us hey when you do this you're going to get that yeah well they didn't always know that you know when you go far enough back in time and they're talking about these gods and deities it was magic it was very special <laughs> but that the woman may not think herself excused from the exertions of fortitude or exempt from the casualties of war, she, admonish, she is admonished by the very ceremonial of her marriage that she comes to her husband as a partner in toils and dangers, to suffer and to dare equally with him in peace and in war. This is indicated by the yoked oxen, the harnessed steed, the offered arms. Thus she is to live thus to die she receives what she is in return she is to return inviolate and honored to her children what her daughters-in-law are to receive and again transmit to her grandchildren so when everyone talks about these women there weren't any women warriors and blah 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 i got a historical account of it right there i got a historical account of what the shield maiden really was she was equal in she was not exempt from the exertions of fortitude, exempt from casualties of war, and she was given her own set of arms. Well, there's a thousand year old writing of it, probably a first hand account <laughs> that these women fought right alongside these men. They were not exempt from it. And her responsibility was to pass it down to her children what her daughter-in-laws are to receive and again transmit to her grandchildren. These women stood beside their men. These men were worth standing beside. And that's an important thing to consider. They live therefore fenced around with chastity, corrupted by no seductive spectacles and no convivial incitements. Men and women are alike unacquainted with clandestine correspondence. Adultery is extremely rare among so numerous a people. Its punishment is instant and at the pleasure of the husband. All right, now we're talking. He cuts off the hair. Sif cuts off, or Loki cut off the hair of Sif. Um, it's written that way, but more actually, it was, a, it was the rape of Sif. He cuts off the hair of the offender, strips her, and in the presence of her relations, expels her from his house and pursues her with stripes through the whole village. So, Back then, you had to remember, yeah, it's a broken heart. There's also disease that's passed around that there's no cure for. So when a woman steps out like that or a man steps out like that and brings home something they can't shake off and it makes them insane and they die a slow, painful death of some venereal disease, <laughs> that's a real issue. It also says that in the Misty Hell, there are there is a special place for oath breakers, murderers, and the deceivers of men's wives. So this kind of stuff between a man and a woman is taken very seriously for health reasons, as well as for, it's how you build a solid community. You can't trust somebody that's trying to sneak around and fool around with your wife or some kind of clandestine correspondence. Christianity come along, well, you can ask forgiveness. Back then, you were going to be eaten on by snakes and dragons at the bottom of the tree, sunk into a bog. Those, those crimes that were sunk into a bog are, are crimes that were to be hidden out of sight. Neither beauty, youth, nor riches can procure her a husband, for none there looks, let's see, nor is any indulgence shown to a prostitute. No indulgence is shown to a prostitute. Now, I'm sure somebody had himself a, 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 a housemaid out in the barn somewhere screwing around. It's human nature. People are going to do that. <laughs> but probably not so much as we might think. Nor is any indulgence, uh, neither beauty, youth, nor riches can procure her a husband. For none there looks on vice with a smile. None there looks on vice with a smile. Or calls mutual seduction 
the way of the world. What are we, animals? No. Still more exemplary is the practice of those states in which none but virgins marry, and the expectations and wishes of a wife are at once brought to a period. Thus they take one husband as one body and one life. Few things point that out as dramatically as Nana, whose heart burst when Baldur's funeral pyre was lit, and she joined him on a new type of journey. That no thought, no desire may extend beyond him, and he may be loved not only as their husband, but as their marriage. To limit the increase of children or to put to death any of the later progeny, progeny is accounted infamous, and good habits have their more influence than good laws elsewhere. That's a powerful thing. Good habits have their more influence than good laws elsewhere. We have a lot of laws that tell us what not to do and how to do it, and we can't do this and we can't do that. Um, how about we cultivate some good habits like our ancestors did? Now they we're talking about building something so much more stable than people can begin to imagine. It is our heritage. It is what we are capable of doing. What if we became the men that were worth that kind of dedication? Wow. Now we're talking about something. Not running off on some foolhardy gambit. Not trying to do something to make a quick buck on the side where we end up in prison. Not ended up, you know, doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing. What if all of a sudden we became the kind of men that really could be called honorable by our wives, who would have no doubt to trust us? Now we're talking about a future, a real future. Not concepts, not things to be upset or angered or, or somebody else's idea of what it should be, but something really worth defending. So that idea of proving ourselves may not lay outside on the field of battle, but it might lie right there with the woman that we've decided to be with. If she can live up to that, shouldn't it, wouldn't it behoove us to live up to what we're capable of? and make ourselves worthy of that. Now we're talking something. Man, I think this is golden. I think this is awesome stuff. I think it's just, it's just, um, and I think perhaps there's a lot of us that think, oh, that's just a pipe dream. But they did it for a long, long time. I think it's within us to do the same thing. In every house, the children grow up thinly and meanly clad to that bulk of body and limb which we behold with wonder. So these scrawny runts grow up to be these gigantic men rowing a boat, beating a horn, landing on your shore, and just kicking the shit out of everybody. Every mother suckles her own children and does not deliver them into the hands of servants and nurses. So the roles of motherhood are taken seriously. No indulgence distinguishes the young master from the slave. So they grow up tough. They grow up tough. They lie together amidst the same cattle upon the same ground till age separates and valor marks out the freeborn. The youths partake late of the pleasures of love and hence pass the age of puberty unexhausted. Nor are the virgins hurried into marriage. The same maturity, the same full growth is required. The sexes unite equally matched and robust and the children inherit the vigor of their parents. So quite simply, there were other things far more important to the raising of these children and these, these boys and these girls to become something better. <laughs> from, their, from youth, they're, they're raised up to unite equally matched, robust. Their children inherit the vigor of the parents. Children are regarded with equal affection by their maternal uncles as by their fathers. So now all of a sudden, there's more than one masculine figure in the lives of these childs promoting what it means to be a man. Some even consider this as the more sacred bond of consanguinity. Consanguin Good night. It's damn Romans. And prefer it to the requisition of hostages, as if it held the mind of a firmer tie and the family by a more extensive obligation. A person's own children, however, are his heirs and successors. No wills are made. If there are no children, the next in order of inheritance are brothers, paternal, and maternal uncles. The more numerous are a man's relations and kinsmen, the more comfortable is his old age. Nor is it here any advantage to be childless. 
Yeah, we're going to grow old. We're going to pass. Time's going to pass. We don't want to do that by ourselves. It, it's important to love those members of our family that are around us. And if you're living in, uh, on the, upon the, if you grow up tough amidst the same cattle upon the same ground till age separates and valor marks out the freeborn, now we've done something. And the girls, they're not hurried into marriage. They pass the age of puberty unexhausted. They, they grow up with a much different focus than we are. Everything we're focused on is something outside so that somebody else will think better of us. Here we have more than one masculine image in the home saying, right, come on, let's do something fantastic. There's a great future for you. There's something special going to happen. You will meet someone. Love will take your heart. <laughs> Here we are in like urban cowboy walking around singing Gilly's bullshit, talking about looking for love. These children were raised with a healthy understanding of what it meant and a standard that went with it. It is indispensable duty to adopt the in enmities of a father or relation as well as their friendship. These, however, are not irreconcilable or perpetual. Even homicide is atoned by a certain fine in cattle and sheep. And the whole family accepts the satisfaction to the advantage of the public wheel, since quarrels are most dangerous in a free state. No people are more addicted. Okay, so there was a time that it got so out of hand <laughs> that, that uh, ah, I can't think of the name. There was a law code that was passed, and it shows, you know, what the fine was and they finally had to put a stop to it because these people were going to killing each other and you know making a fortune on all this meat they were getting <laughs> no people are more addicted to social entertainments or more liberal in the exercise of hospitality so if you have built a confident group of people in your home who understand who they are, what their future might be. They are marked of valor because they're free born. The girls are taken care of and not rushed into some foolhardy endeavor. You probably got pretty secure, confident idea in your home. People that have something worth defending. It's easy to be hospitable when you have that kind of confidence in your home. And these people enjoyed it. So one of the benefits of their life was the ability to indulge passers-by, guests. Come on in, sit down. They weren't worried. They're in a free state. You used to get to screw it around like that. Like I said, there's more than one masculine image in that home. It might be a tussle if you get out of hand. To refuse any person whatever admittance under their roof is accounted plagitious. I don't know. It must be bad. Because it might be Odin. It could be Freya. Everyone, according to his ability, feasts his guests. So you do the best you can. You bring people in, you sit down, and as it says in the hive of all, get them over there, warm them up by the fire. Here's a cup of meat. Do you want something to eat? It's almost like being down south. I can't tell you how many times my dad would take me down to Tahlequah, and I'd show up with my cousins, and next thing I know, there's a meal on the table, and we were eating together. It was just the way things were. It was our family. Here it is a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, 3000 years ago. Feasts his, to his own ability, feasts his guests. When his provisions are exhausted, he who was the late the host is now the guide and companion to another hospitable board. Let's go see my buddies. Let's go over to my buddy's house. They enter the next house uninvited and are received with equal cordiality because there's no threat. No one makes distinction with the respect to the rights of hospitality between a stranger and an acquaintance. They're secure in who they are. They're going to share of their abundance and what they have worked hard for and what they've secured. The departing guest is presented with whatever he may ask for. And with the same freedom, a boon is desired in return. So they, once again, they exchange gifts. They are pleased with presence, but think no obligation incurred either when they give or receive. So it's not, a gift for a gift is, here's a gift. I'm going to feel good about giving this gift, whether or not you give me anything in return. The first person to benefit from the giving of a gift is the person who gives it. <laughs> their manner of living with their guest is easy and affable. 
As soon as they arise from sleep, which they generally protract till late in the day, they bathe, usually in warm water, as cold weather chiefly prevails there. And after bathing, they take their meal, each on a distinct seat and a separate table. Then they proceed armed to business and not less frequently to convivial parties, in which it is no disgrace to pass days and nights without intermission in drinking. The, the frequent quarrels that arise amongst them when intoxicated seldom terminate in abusive language, but more frequently in blood. So they don't sit around and talk about it. They're not gonna sit there and talk smack. They're gonna get up and, and uh, pop you in the jaw. That's an important thing to understand. Something we should do more of. In their feast, they generally deliberate on the reconcilement of enemies, on family alliances, on the appointments of chiefs, and finally on peace and war. Conceiving that at no time the soul is more open to sincerity or warms to heroism. <laughs> so when you're sitting around drinking, you know, a drunk man's words or a, or a sober man's thoughts, they're going to come out with what needs to come out. And what's supposed to happen is going to happen. These people naturally avoid to artifice or disguise, disclose the most secret emotions of their hearts in the freedom of festivity. Like I said, a drunk man's words are a sober man's thoughts. They're not afraid to tell someone, I care about you. There's no risk to their heart. They're confident in who they are. If that person doesn't like them, it doesn't change anything. So they respect them. They, they, give a, they give a damn. That's an important thing to give a damn because everybody's walking around. Oh, he's going to hurt me. Oh, they're going to hurt my feelings. Well, these people aren't sitting around worried about their feelings because <laughs> they know who they are. Okay. So that person doesn't like me. Not a big deal. I feel, I still feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> Can we cultivate that in this faith? Might be one of the most important things we do. <laughs> The minds of all beings thus displayed without reserve, the subjects of their deliberation are again canvassed the next day, and each time has its advantage. They consult when unable to dissemble, they determine when not liable to mistake. They consult when unable to dissemble, they determine when not liable to mistake. So they talk about it, they sleep on it, they talk about it some more, and they make a decision. Their drink is a liquor prepared from barley or wheat, brought by fermentation to a certain semblance of wine. Those who border on the Rhine also purchase wine. Their food is simple, wild fruits, fresh venison, or coagulated milk. They satisfy hunger without seeking the elegances and delicacies of the table. Their thirst for liquor is not quenched with equal moderation. If their propensity to drunkenness be gratified to the extent of their wishes, intemperance proves as effectual in subduing them as the force of arms. So you can get them drunk and you might win. But look at that diet, wild fruits, fresh venison, cheese, wine, mead. So they got barley or wheat. <laughs> so that again calls into question their ability to be farmers because if somebody likes to drink that much, he's gonna grow some barley or wheat. He's gonna know how to do it right. So obviously they're taking care of it. They like to drink. <laughs> Something else to consider too. You know, it wasn't just alcohol in that drink. There were other substances in that drink. That at that time was one of the surest ways to enter an altered state. That was maybe how you encountered the divine. You know, those altered states of consciousness that are people are fond of talking about today, but back then it was probably pretty common. If you're drunk for three days, you're going to start seeing shit. You know, if there's something other than alcohol in that liquor, who's to say what your connection to the divine might be? Um, I'm not talking about a street corner drunk preaching Jesus. I'm talking about just a simple, confident individual who's had a few to drink and he has that aha moment. It might be something as simple as that. But every man had his ability to make a connection with the divine in his own home. Now there were guidances, there were borders, there were boundaries, there were things, but it was whatever strengthened the tribe, but every man could approach the divine and make requests for fertility in his own home for courage in his own home, you know, for wisdom, 
in his own home. There was no intercessor. There was nothing that says the best part of you is out there. Every man understood the best part of me is in here, in this home, surrounded by people I love. And once again, we're talking about a beautiful thing. They only have one kind of public spectacle, which is exhibited in every company. Young men who make it their diversion dance naked amidst drawn swords and presented spears. So this is similar to Balder. When everybody's throwing a weapon at him or throwing stones at him and everything promised not to hurt him, that's exactly what's happening right here, except these are mortals doing it. Balder slipped. He dodged left when he should have zagged right. Hell, I don't know. Same thing happens here. <laughs> but that's, if someone is damaged in that or is hurt in that, now all of a sudden we've got a spiritual journey to talk about. He's on another journey. And who's to say when he's going to return? Who's to say what it's going to look like? So there's an element there of spirituality in that. If you're doing that and you have that element of spirituality, why it might make it all the more imperative that you give it all you got to do it. Practice has conferred skill at this exercise and skill has given grace. But they do not exhibit for hire or gain the only reward of this pastime, though a hazardous one, is the pleasure of the spectators. What is extraordinary, they play at dice when sober as a serious business. And that was such a desperate venture of gain or loss that when everything else is gone, they set their liberties and persons on the last throw. The loser goes into voluntary servitude. And though the youngest and strongest patiently suffers himself to be bound in insult, such is their obstinacy in a bad practice. They, call it, they themselves call it honor. The slaves thus acquired are exchanged away in commerce that the winner may get rid of the scandal of his victory. <laughs> so if you're living a good life and you're doing everything right and it's all going according, you're living according to the will of the gods and you're weird and all that stuff, you should be winning at dice. And if you're not, well, maybe that's what you deserve. To stick by your word in that kind of situation means something. But there's another thing that goes with that, and I've always drawn a parallel between the two. German legionnaires were in the Roman army at the time of the supposed crucifixion of Christ. And if you read about that, at the foot, there were a group of soldiers casting lots. One of them decided to pierce him in the side. Why do you think he did that? That Roman legionnaire may not have been a Roman. He may have been a German. He may have been one from one of the cell sword tribes in the Roman military occupying a foreign land. We know that the Varangian guard around Constantinople was a very powerful force to contend with. Who's to say that that's not where that come from? The casting of lots during the crucifixion. That sounds like something any soldier would do. Well, them guys are gonna hang up there and die. Let's play some spades. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of how it goes. But I've often wondered, is that the case? Is that a part of the Germanization of Christianity to make it more familiar to us? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> the rest of their slaves have not, like ours, particular employments in the family, a lot of them. Each is the master of a habitation and household of his own. The Lord requires from him a certain quantity of grain, cattle, or cloth as from a tenant. And so far, only the sub subjugation of the slave extends. So you got a slave, but it's not like, you know, slavery here in the South or in the Caribbean or in the Middle East of today. These guys had, had a certain standard of living. They had to produce so much and who's liable to have been quite high. It might, probably really sucked. <laughs> How they survived, who knows? Um, but they had their own habitation. They had their own household. <laughs> his domestication offices, his domestic offices are performed by his own wife and children. So the slave takes care of everything. The wife and children take care of the house. It is usual to scourge a slave or punish him with chains or hard labor. They are sometimes killed by their masters, not through severity of chastisement, but in the heat of passion, like an enemy. With this difference, that is done with impunity. Freedmen are little superior to slaves, seldom filling any important office in the family, never in the state, except in those tribes which are under regal government. 
There they rise above the freeborn, and even the nobles, in the rest, the subordinate condition of the freedman is a proof of freedom. So it gets kind of confusing within their social structure. Um, if he, if he, if the guy toms out and kills you, you know, that's just kind of how it is. But there are some opportunity here. So even, even those men had an opportunity to better themselves in that community. And that's not something you find. Even this lowest born of the community might have an opportunity to become something better. <laughs> Lending money by interest and increasing it by usury is unknown amongst them. And this ignorance more effectually prevents the practice than a prohibition would do. So they didn't make their money work for them. Kind of an alien concept. It's one that cripples a lot of people in today's world. I'm going to loan you some money, but there's going to be a big on it. You're going to have to pay a little bit of interest. Um, these people were honorable people. They didn't play any of that nonsense. You need to borrow some money. Here's a little money. Pay it back. But you got to remember, for that kind of stuff, perhaps there was some gratitude involved in it. Here's a gift. Here's a portion of my harvest. Here's a slave. Here's who knows what. Here's a fine weapon. Here's a fine shield. <laughs> the benefits of being right in what you're doing far outweigh the benefits of being uh, kind of a social piranha. You know, here, I'm going to loan you some money. I'm going to loan you some money. Let me get a little interest from both of you and I'll become a very wealthy man. And you guys see, he didn't earn that by valor. He earned that by usury or hustling. Not a lot of honor in that. Though it seems to be predominant. A lot of people make a lot of money on it. If I was smart enough, I'd probably do it. Nah. The lands are occupied by townships and in allotments proportional to the number of cultivators and are afterwards parceled out among the individuals of the district in shares according to the rank and condition of each person. So they're only going to give the good property to the people that can do anything with it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. See, right there you have equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome, as Jordan Peterson is so fond of saying. I find it very interesting that a thousand years ago, that kind of common sense was routine as or 2000 years ago, as opposed to today where it's, it's a radical concept. No, it ain't. It's common sense. That guy that can farm that land, let him have it. Let him farm it. It's going to be a benefit to everybody for that guy to be successful as he can possibly be. If those people have what it takes to go out and be successful, support him, encourage him, back him up. That's what we have right here. <laughs> if he's an older man, he can't really do a lot. Well, let's, he's going to be taken care of. He's going to get a little bit of a lot, probably have a little garden and grow some tomatoes. You know, that's what you do. The quality of opportunity. If those tomatoes come in at a boom harvest and he gets to go here and make a fortune selling, truck, truck selling that stuff, hey, good for him. <laughs> and we should all have that opportunity, not the opportunity of outcome equality of outcome because I might not want to work it that hard hmm. I might want to write a book and get rich who knows Shit. <laughs> the wide extent of plain facilitates this partition the arable lands are annually changed and a part left fallow nor do they attempt to make the most of the fertility and plenty of the soil by their own industry in planting orchards and closing meadows and watering gardens Corn is the only product acquired from the earth, hence their year is not divided into so many seasons as ours. For while they know and distinguish by name winter, spring, and summer, they are unacquainted equally with the appellation and bounty of autumn. I don't quite believe all that. <laughs> he kind of talks out of both sides of his mouth there. You got to remember, he's writing a lot of this, and he is pointing out the failings of a Roman society when Nero was the emperor. So he's pointing out, hey, look, these people up here are doing this, and we're down here playing the screw-around game, and our emperor's an ins insane. But they have the land. It's taken care of. So he's talking about an equitable kind of government that is not there in Rome. It's the finest parts of the enemy are head and shoulders above the best parts of Rome at this time by him. So he's writing this. Now, if he were to come out and say that, they'd have cut off his head. But he's a Roman senator. He's under the Emperor Nero. Things probably look pretty bad in Rome. <laughs> hmm, imagine that. Probably not too much different than what's going on in much of the world today. We need to start looking. You know, hell, 
Maybe we do need a king. <laughs> One that earns it. I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> the funerals are without parade. The only circumstance to which they attend is to burn the bodies of eminent persons with some particular kinds of wood. Now, I would love to know what those particular kinds of wood are. Uh, neither vestments nor perfumes are heaped upon the pile. And that kind of goes against what we hear with uh, uh, the, the Arab who wrote down the, uh, well, it's the beginning of the 13th warrior. That was, I can't think of that guy's name, but there is a historical account of that. And it goes against the account of Balder. I mean, Balder, he had a horse went with him, his wife went with him, he went on the greatest of ships. But that is, uh, yeah, I'm gonna finish that real quick. And sometimes the arms of the deceased and sometimes his horse are given to the flames. The tomb is a mound of turf. They contemn the elaborate and costly honors of monumental structures as mere burthens to the dead. They soon dismiss tears and lamentations, slowly, sorrow and regret. They think it the woman's part to bewail their friends and the men's to remember them. We'll finish up this last part some other time. This is about the tribes and whatnot. But that last part about the funerals, I think that that may well be the, the cultivation of our ability to live lives as men is important. One of the final things that I think this faith of Osetri will have to really contend with is, is exactly what it means when we do pass away. What are we going to contend with when we meet the sun facing goddess at the entrance to the burial mound? Hell. What will it look like? What are we going to deal with? The halls of our ancestors beckon us. For the warrior, Valhalla, Vingolf, Folkfang. For the drowned sailor, it's the halls of Rand's kingdom. For those that die maidens, Gefian, they attend her. She has her own hall for those that die maidens. And if you remember what we just read, that's any of those girls that died before they got married, Gefian must have had a magnificent place full of maidens. So there's a number of different places where the dead may go, but mostly it's the halls of your ancestors. Because not everybody died a warrior. Not everybody died in, or was buried in the mass grave to go to Valhalla, Vingal, or Folkvang. Most people died at home. Some kind of disease or illness or old age. Most women, some children, <laughs> they went to the halls of their ancestors. And those halls are located within Hell's realm. Elheim. And as such, she has, she's the guardian that has access to that torch of wisdom and inspiration that all of our ancestors hold. She's the one that allows us to hear the songs of our ancestors. So there's a big, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area. And I'll tell you, one of the bravest things that I ever saw was from my own grandpa and I've said it many times and I'll say it again and I'll close this out. My grandfather was a lifelong atheist. <laughs> he did think, he did tell me that if anything powered anything on this earth, it's that sun up there in the sky, that's probably what's worthy of worship. Um, he always thought that it was a foolish idea that a man could be an absolute piece of shit for most of his life and then just before he dies, he could pray and get into heaven. He always thought that was the most biggest bunch of nonsense ever. Well, as he lay dying, the hospice nurse asked him, you know, Carl, do you want us to, uh, do you want me to call over preacher so-and-so? He said, no. She kept asking him, and finally he said yes. So the day came, and the guy called, said, well, I'm fixing to come over. And she said, Carl, he's fixing to come over. You want him to come over? And he stopped for a moment. My mom was standing there, and he said, no, I don't think I do. He said, I don't think I'm going to lie to get into whatever they say comes next. I'm going to go find out on my own. Dude, if he was still walking around, I'd buy him a wheelbarrow to put his testicles in because that, that took courage. At the last moment, when you're fixing to die, you have no idea what's coming next. I'm so proud that that, is, that was my grandfather. That's my heritage. That's my ancestor that stood up and said, no, I'm going to face it like a man the way I faced my life. Um, maybe that's what we should be cultivating as we step into that next round. <laughs> Who knows? Whatever the answer might be, it's probably going to be so radical.
completely different from anything we can imagine. Uh, I don't know if our brains could con contain it. But be that as it may, I'm done. I, uh, I'm, I'm done talking about it tonight. Oh, well, I'm, I didn't even see you on here, man. I'm glad you're here. I, uh, I appreciate everyone's time here tonight. It's kind of a long-winded subject, but I do enjoy it. There's so much information in that. And the more you read it and the more you read other books and then you go back and read it again, you're like, holy cow, look at what this really was. <laughs> and it, uh, it gives me hope, that great opiate of the masses. <laughs> but there's something to that, you know, to, to, I just, maybe it is too heavily romanticized, but I don't know. But do I think we can achieve it in this day and age? Well, I don't know if we can. But I think we're at that point where we damn sure better start trying. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them and chew the fat for a little bit. Oh. Put on my special glasses to bring out my proper chakra. I don't know. It's hard to <laughs> 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 They're supposed to bring out the right chakra. I don't know what that is, but we'll find out. Is it green? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's another thing, too. We need to be having fun in this. It ain't so all damn serious. Good night. <laughs> tell a, damn, tell a dirty joke. If it's your root <laughs> chakra, stay sitting down, please. Right, right. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Holy cow. Who knew I could talk so much? <laughs> okay, guys. I am... Uh, I got to go take some medicine. My nose is stopped up. And I'm just... Uh. Every time them kids go back to school, Scarlet brings home every sickness. Every one of them screaming kids brings in. I'm like, oh, my gosh. That's homeschool. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate you joining in. I am uh, I'm going to get off here, guys. And I, I appreciate you. everybody's time. Y'all have, have, have a good Monday. Go out there and give them hell. Let's show them what you're made of. <laughs> That's right. Y'all take care. Bye-bye. Love all. God's bless.